Tenet may not be the best film ever made. At times it feels like rather hard work and a bit of a mess, but I hope I'm going to explain that it's really quite brilliant, so please keep watching to find out how I come to that conclusion. Before we start, here is my recommendation. Go through the film entirely to get the general gist of it, then watch the whole of the extras disc, we'll only, which will only take about an hour or so, and then watch the film again, and then you've got a pretty good chance of actually following everything that's been going on. Now, if ever there was a film that required a commentary track, this was it, but alas, there's nothing there to give us that additional information from director Christopher Nolan. Now, his cinematographer of choice is Hoity Van Hoytema, and I think he first worked with him on the science fiction masterpiece Interstellar. That was another film that hardly anyone seemed to understand, so perhaps there's a pattern developing here. I saw Interstellar at the Waterloo IMAX and it was one of the most memorable cinematic experiences I've ever had. The similarities to and influence of 2001 A Space Odyssey were obvious to me, and similarly to 2001's 70mm Cinerama Origins, the massive 70mm IMAX frame made Interstellar something very special indeed. It is a great 4K disc, but sadly something that extra special is missing on the interstellar transfer, and I suspect it's the same with this fantastic 4K disc of Tenet. Both these films really were meant to be seen at the IMAX. Tenet was released on the 26th of August 2020 here in the UK, and it completely passed me by owing to the COVID-19 pandemic. That's why I didn't get to see it at one of the few genuine IMAX theatres. Now, I thought there were only three IMAX cinemas in Britain, but it seems there's a fourth at the Manchester Odeon, besides the two in London and the one in Bradford. And it appears that at Manchester they do have full 70mm film IMAX capability. So it's worth checking there to ensure a film is being screened rather than a video projection before making a special trip, because projecting video purporting to be IMAX really does not have the same unsurpassed impressive clarity of film. So always check before making a special trip that an IMAX really is showing a 70mm print. IMAX has a similarity to VistaVision in that it travels horizontally through the frame. The big difference is that VistaVision is a 35mm format and IMAX is 70mm. Not only that, but each single frame of IMAX is 15 sprockets wide. When video scanning of 35mm was starting for special effects manipulation back in the late 80s and early 90s, I was told that a single frame of 35mm equated to around 40 megabytes on the computer. For 35mm negative, that was more than doubled at 80 to 90 megabytes. Normal 70mm film is over three times the image area of 35mm, and with IMAX being three times that of standard 70mm, I can only guess at the uncompressed storage area required for a single frame of IMAX negative, perhaps as much as one or two gigabytes. So when you consider there are 24 frames in every second, perhaps it is no wonder that something is being lost upon video transfer for the home market. I'll leave a link to a video down below which will show an IMAX projector in operation, albeit an Omnimax, but it's more or less the same and you'll get the general idea. Now, one of these projectors running really has to be seen to be believed because it really is an engineering marvel and with so much film rushing through the projector at that rate of knots it really is quite incredible that the whole thing simply doesn't explode. Most of Tenet is filmed in IMAX with Mr. Hoytema often hand-holding his special design of IMAX camera. It may not be as massive and bulky as a normal IMAX camera, but it's still a pretty significant piece of kit to put on your shoulder. Being miniaturised means the film magazine has to be changed more frequently, which must be somewhat inconvenient, but with around 1.5 million feet of IMAX shot for this film, it must be the most extensive ever use of the format for a single production. 
For the dialogue sequences, Panavision System 65 was used and there is no perceptible difference in the overall clarity of the two formats on the 4K disc other than the 2.2 to 1 ratio of the Panavision frame against the cropped IMAX frame which is reduced to 185 to 1 from its original 1.364 to 1 as seen in genuine IMAX theatres. As I mentioned, this film is a little difficult to follow, so go into this with the expectation that what you're about to see is a somewhat incoherent James Bond adventure with a science fiction twist. The main character is never named, but seems to be known simply as the protagonist, and he is played by John David Washington. The villain is Andre Sator and played by Kenneth Branagh. And now that I mention Branagh, his own 70mm production of Death on the Nile, the follow-up to Murder on the Orient Express, which is still the best quality 4K image I've seen on a disc, is due to be released to cinemas this year, 2021. So keep a lookout for theatres capable of screening Death on the Nile in 70mm film for an exceptional cinema outing. The protagonist's assistant Neil is played by Robert Pattinson and his part in the story is more important than you realise until at the very end when he actually fills us in on a few of the more important details. But I think you have to know what's coming in order to understand the meaning of what he says and does. Even then, it could still take some working out. This is not a time travel film per se, but it does involve a sort of time bending. A world ending weapon known as the algorithm, or at some times plutonium 241, has been sent back from the future, and if our protagonist James Bond character does not retrieve all nine separate parts of this weapon, which have been scattered for some reason all over the world, then our supervillain Andre Sator could obtain them all, put them together and invert the whole of time, thereby bringing about the end of the world. Sator already has the scientific capability to invert time, and throughout the film you'll see several of these time-inverting temporal turnstiles, but unless you know what they are when they appear, it will be entirely confusing. It's also important to know that anyone inverted to travel backwards through time will be often indicated by something blue, whereas everything forwards is indicated by red. Also, if a character appears wearing breathing apparatus, then that too is a sign he is travelling backwards, because apparently, when inverted, it is impossible to breathe backwards. As for the black suits worn when inverted, that is explained briefly as a necessity to avoid a character meeting and touching himself, because the same matter coming into contact with itself will result in annihilation. Are you keeping up? Inverted time moves at the same speed as forwards time, so to go backwards in time a week will take a week travelling backwards, and that is why on occasion the characters do not seem to be working together with much urgency. As for the title of the film, Tenet, this word is a palindrome which is entirely suitable. It also means the film can make good use of the number 10, and this is best illustrated during the spectacular closing battle scene, whereby one team moves against the villains from a 10 minute countdown coming from inverted time, and another team is on a 10 minute countdown from normal time, and this two pronged attack is known as a temporal pincer. I watched a lot of this film wondering quite how they did the amazing special effects and assumed much of it had to have been done using computer generated imagery. I was wrong. Most of the effects in this were done in camera and the characters had to learn to do their movements both forwards and backwards. And indeed on the extras disc, Kenneth Branagh tells us that there was one scene he had to speak Russian backwards in a Russian accent while acting and moving backwards and he managed not to fall on his face. So that must have taken quite a lot of practice. So keep an eye out for what looks like strange movements in the characters and extras all over the screen because this is probably the actors carrying out their intended actions backwards with the IMAX camera re-engineered to run in reverse. The results are often spectacular. The image quality on this 4K disc is one of the best, thereby confirming its IMAX and Panavision System 65 origins. 
and the DTS HD 5.1 audio is quite unbelievable. It really is a wall of sound coming at you from all directions, and perhaps a more suitable title than Tenet would have been THX Enit, because it certainly gave my system in here a workout like it's never had before. Many people who view this channel regularly will know that I'm always comparing the 4K to the Blu-ray because quite often there is little perceptible difference. But in this pack, the Blu-ray looks a little lifeless and disappointing compared to the 4K, and that is showing the advantage that HDR provides. But if you do not yet have the 4K HDR capabilities, then the Blu-ray is still exceptional, so worth giving it a try, even if it doesn't come close to the quality of offered on the 4K. Having had the benefit of many genuine 70mm IMAX screenings over the years, I can well imagine how this film looked on the giant IMAX screen. So if I ever see this film is being screened at the Waterloo IMAX again in the future, I'm getting on the bus. I don't suppose it comes as any surprise that I thoroughly enjoyed scrutinising this work of art, and in spite of the worldwide confusion it must surely be instigating, I think it's worth giving it a spin. So, thoroughly recommended from me. Now, the next review I plan to do is something many people have asked me to take a look at, and that is a science fiction masterpiece from 1979 known as Alien. So. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and perhaps consider subscribing so I'll be encouraged to produce similar content again in the future. In the meantime, bye bye for now.